if ever you get the chance to come and visit Uganda, my country, you'll be surprised to find that we have not just one, but five kings. We have five kings. Now what is strange is that Uganda is in fact a republic, just like the United States. We're not a monarchy. So how do we end up having five kings? Well, Uganda, like many countries in Africa, was formed as a combination of many kingdoms and chiefdoms. And today, those kings hold no political power. They are more like cultural figureheads. And so there's a lot of excitement whenever there's something, some kind of festivity to do with the king, a coronation or a wedding. So you see the children singing, the women dancing, and the men prostrate themselves in front of the king to honor him. And when I was a child, I used to enjoy watching these festivals for their pomp, for their color, for their glamour. And I imagine that here in America, the closest thing you have to, to that might be the British royal family, which holds a certain fascination for some of us. And so we delight to watch the coronations, the weddings of the British royal family. Some of us wept when the queen died. And a fair number of people, as, I, as far as I can tell from the media, like to follow what's going on with the British royal family and to disapprove of things that they do or to praise them when they think they're doing well. I find that as I grow older, I get less excited about the royal families in Uganda and in Britain and elsewhere in the world. In fact, I find that I'm, I feel a bit disturbed by the very idea of, of royalty. So the people in Uganda who sing and dance and prostrate themselves for the king, I wonder if many of them are aware that they pay a lot in taxes to maintain the extravagant lifestyle of those kings. I wonder if they know that the kings have inherited a huge amount of land which goes unused, whilst they, their subjects, have to eke out a living on very small plots of land. And even with the British royal family, so we had King Charles visiting Kenya recently. And as usual, there's the same you know, pomp and glamour and you know, celebrations to welcome King Charles. But in the newspaper columns, people were asking the question, wait a minute, this man's family enslaved us. This man's family colonized us. Why would we give him a warm welcome? At the very least, he should apologize for what his ancestors did to our ancestors. The people of Israel for a long time did not have a king. And so, in the first book of Samuel, we have a description of what happened and how they got a king. They asked God, we would like to have a king. And so God, through the prophet Samuel, tells the people of Israel, wait a minute. You know that if you get a king, if you get a king, he's going to take away your properties from you. He's going to send your men to war, to die. He's going to tax you for whatever you've got so that he can live a fancy lifestyle for his court and for his, 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 his employees. Are you sure you want a king? Because he's going to make servants, slaves of you. But the people of Israel said, yes, we want a king because everyone else has a king. And we want to have a king for ourselves. And so God said, fair enough, you'll have your king. And when they got the king, or the kings, 
They did exactly what God had said would happen. They exploited the people. And when the kingdom of Israel was lost, they continued to look forward to the day when they would have a new king. Jesus was meant to be the king who was to come. And so the people of Israel looked to Jesus as though he might restore the kingdom of Israel, make, to make Israel a great kingdom as it used to be in the past. However, Jesus was very reluctant to be called king. You might remember that when Jesus was being tried before he was killed, he was asked many times, are you the king of the Jews? And so Jesus says, you say that I am. In the Gospel of John, he actually says, my kingdom is not of this world. And so for the people of Israel, for those who are looking forward to the greatness of Israel, it was a big disappointment to have Jesus as king. That is what he's accused of. He was accused of being the king of the Jews. But he's unlike any king that you'd imagine. So the kings of this world wear crowns full of jewels. Jesus wears a crown of thorns. The kings of this world wear glamorous clothes. Jesus is naked on the cross. The kings of this world exploit their subjects to enrich themselves. Jesus is already poor, and what little he has, he gives away freely without asking for anything back in return. There's one respect in which you might say the kingdom of Jesus, or the kingship of Jesus, is somewhat similar to the kingships of this world, and that respect is justice. However, the justice of Jesus is quite different from the justice that we experience on earth. Here in the US, we like to say equal justice under the law. In reality, if one is rich, one can expect a very different kind of justice from those who are poor. When one is rich, one can hire the best lawyers one can, can file as many appeals as, as they want. The poor don't have that luxury, and so the poor suffer the brunt of justice. But the justice of Jesus is quite the opposite of earthly justice. The justice of Jesus favors the poor and those who help the poor. And that is why we hear in the gospel today what will happen to those who take care of the hungry, the stranger, the sick, the naked, and what happens to those who do not take care of them? That is God's justice. But ultimately, the kingship of Jesus, as we hear from the first reading, is really a kingship of, of compassion, a kingship of care. It has no desire to dominate, no desire to conquer. Quite the opposite. The kingship of Jesus is fulfilled by healing the sick, by looking for the lost sheep. You might remember from your catechism that at the moment that we are baptized, we become priests, we become prophets, we become kings. And so I like to tell the babies I'm being baptized and their families that we are all kings and queens, okay? But we're not really a royal family that um, enjoys glamour and wealth and power. Quite the opposite. Our kingship is very much the kingship of, of Jesus. It's not a kingship of power. It's a kingship of, of service. It's not a kingship of, of glamour. It's a kingship of simplicity. It's not a kingship of great wealth. It's a kingship of actual poverty. Thank you for participating in this production of our virtual mass. 
Your presence means so much. Every day, so many parishioners connect to OLPH through the digital ministry. The digital ministry is one of almost 80 ministries supported by the parish. That's why your support of the parish is crucial, so we can continue to have the resources to fund all of our ministries that touch the lives of many. Thank you for watching, continue to watch, and thanks again for your support.